Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Russian honey cake. That's right, there are basically three different ways you can make this amazing cake. The hard way, the harder way, and the way we're going to do it the hardest way. But it's all going to be worth it, because once you're finished, you're going to be enjoying one of the most beautiful and delicious cakes of all time. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And the first thing we're going to need to do here, comrades, is burn some honey. So let's go ahead and transfer some honey into a saucepan that we will place over medium heat. And in case you're keeping score at home, I'm using a wildflower honey, but I have to think pretty much any honey is going to work in this. And I know I just said we're going to burn the honey, but that's not really true. All right, all we're really going to do is cook this until it's like one shade darker and sort of takes on the aroma of caramel, or as I pronounced it all my life, caramel. And yes, it is insane I'm using a pan this small because it is probably going to foam up and you do not want this boiling over on your stove. So you go ahead and use something a little deeper. But anyway, I went ahead and cooked mine for about 10 minutes or so until, like I said, it kind of darkened up a bit. And I started smelling that distinct aroma of caramelized sugar. And then once we push that as far as we want to go, what we'll do is turn off the heat and whisk in a little splash of cold, fresh water, which will immediately stop this from cooking any further, plus make the texture a little bit thinner once it cools. And then once that's set, we'll push it to the back of the stove and we'll place a large metal bowl over our lowest heat setting, into which we will toss a whole bunch of butter. And for the record, this bowl is supposed to be placed over simmering water and not directly on the flame. But just like when I make hollandaise, I like to live dangerously. And as long as we have a really, really low heat setting, this will be fine. And then to the butter, we will also add a touch of white sugar, as well as some of our recently burned honey, plus some regular honey. And then what we'll do to this is absolutely nothing. We will simply let it sit there until our butter melts. And while we're waiting, what we should do is take some baking soda, not powder, baking soda, and add some salt to it as well as some cinnamon, because we're gonna be tossing that in in a few minutes. And then what we'll do once our butter melts, or almost melts, is go ahead and give this a whisk and leave it over the heat until it's very warm to the touch. All right, not super hot and not just barely warm. And then what we'll do once that is very warm to the touch is go ahead and add six cold eggs. And we'll go ahead and whisk those in. And relax, this is not so hot that it's gonna scramble those eggs. Which reminds me, if your eggs scramble, it was too hot. And what we'll do once our eggs have been mixed in is simply keep this over that very low heat setting until the entire mixture comes back to that very warm temperature. And sure, a temperature would help here, but you're not getting one. You have to learn to use the force and your fingertips. And then what we'll do as soon as that mixture does feel very warm again, is go ahead and stir in our baking soda cinnamon mixture. And you'll see just after a few minutes of stirring, the mixture is going to change color and get much lighter and it will sort of look thick and foamy. And that's because of all those little tiny bubbles that the baking soda is producing. And then once that's been stirred in and our mixture is hopefully looking a little something like this, we will remove that from the heat into some better light. And we'll go ahead and finish this up by sifting in some all-purpose flour, which we generally don't want to do all at once, so what we'll do is sift this in two or three additions. And as soon as one addition has been stirred in, we will add the next. And once all that flour has been added and stirred in, we should be looking at a somewhat thick, but still fairly runny and easily spreadable batter. So that is looking just about perfect right there. And then what we'll do to form our layers of honey cake is transfer just shy of about half a cup onto the Silpat line baking sheet. And then using ideally an offset spatula, we want to spread this out into about an eight or nine inch circle. And since I have like zero cake making utensils and tools, I just spread mine out using a rubber spatula. But if you Google offset spatula, you'll see what you're supposed to use. And yes, as you can tell from the dirty silpat, I actually did a few before I filmed this one. But don't worry, this one came out just as bad. And then what we'll do once that's set is give it a quick shake and then the old tapa tapa to knock out any big air bubbles. At which point we're gonna cook this at 375 for about six to seven minutes or until it looks like this. And that's it, we only have to do that seven more times. Which is why it's an advantage to have more than one pan and one silpat. And no, my oven didn't magically clean that silpat while it was baking. This was a shot from the other pan I was using. And the shot just happened to be a lot better. But anyway, what we'll wanna do as soon as that comes out of the oven is very carefully slide it off the pan and onto the table, which is gonna allow it to cool a lot faster. And then after about six or seven minutes, it should be cool enough and firm enough to remove from the mat. And by the way, even though the surface looks pretty smooth, you'll see as I flip this upside down onto this piece of parchment, 
Underneath, you will have some spots where bubbles have formed, but do not worry about those. As you'll see, that's not going to cause any problem. And you should be pretty shocked if each layer does not have a few of those. But anyway, I went ahead and did seven more of those, stacking them up with parchment paper between the layers as I went. But I stopped stacking at three, because as you can see in this shot, those first few I piled up sort of stuck to the paper, because this is a relatively sticky cake because of the honey. So I stopped stacking those and just ended up spreading them out on the table like this. And then once all your layers are totally cooled, we can take a plate, in my case a paper plate, and trim around them making sure they're all the same size. And not to brag, but all mine were really close. But even so, I did grab my pizza wheel and I went around so they all had a beautiful, nice, clean edge. But anyway, that's optional. Although if you do it, save the scraps, since we can actually add those to the crumb mixture with which we're gonna coat our cake. And if you're wondering what crumb mixture, well, the crumb mixture we're gonna make with the extra batter. Since if everything goes according to plan, after you've done your eight layers, you should have just about this much batter left, which we will just spread out onto our baking sheet. And we will cook that for about 10 minutes, at which point we'll go ahead and cut this up into smaller pieces. And the whole reason for this is if we left it whole, I think those outside edges might get too dark and possibly burnt, and not burnt honey burnt, like actually burnt. So by making what's basically cake croutons, I think this is all gonna cook a lot more evenly. So we will cut, toss, and go ahead and pop that back in for about maybe seven to 10 minutes more, or until fairly well browned. And by the way, we can also do that with any of our trimmings from earlier. And that's it, once that's all cooled, we can go ahead and give it the old bag and bash until we have some fairly fine crumbs. And then once that's set, we can move on to the last major component, our creamy filling slash frosting, which we're gonna make in a very cold bowl with a very cold whisk. All right, keep those in the fridge until you're ready to use them. And then into that, we will pour two pints of very cold, heavy cream. Okay, when you whip cream, it has to be very cold, especially if you're gonna do it by hand like I do. And of course, go ahead and use your electric beaters if you want. But by doing this by hand, I'm gonna burn off the exact same amount of calories as one slice of cake, give or take 300 calories or so. And what we wanna do here is whip this until we have soft peaks, or what would be a more accurate name, floppy peaks. And then what we'll do once we've achieved those is go ahead and add the rest of our burnt honey, as well as a couple nice big spoons of sour cream. And of course, the regular sour cream to cream ratio is gonna be up to you. But I'm going for a fairly light filling, so I have like four parts cream to one part sour cream. But anyway, we'll go ahead and add that and then continue whisking until we have fairly stiff peaks. All right, we don't wanna to go too far and make butter here, but we do want this mixture getting fairly stiff because it has to hold up all those layers. And when I reach that stage, it looked like this. And that's it, once our cream's done, we can start to assemble. And for this first layer, I went around and trimmed off the parchment right up to the cake, which is gonna give us something to slide our spatulas under. And then we'll go ahead and transfer on a generous cup at least of our whipped cream and spread that out as evenly as we can, almost up to the edge. All right, we don't have to go all the way because the next layer is gonna press it down. And speaking of the next layer, you wanna place a side that has the divots from the air bubbles facing up. That way when we spread on the cream, it's gonna fill in. And of course, as you're putting these on, you're giving them a nice gentle press. But anyway, we'll continue creaming and caking until we have one layer of cake left. And unlike the other ones, this last layer I like to put with the nice side up. So maybe save your smoothest best one for last. And that's it, we'll go ahead and frost the top. And if everything goes according to plan, you should have just enough whipped cream to go around the sides as well, which I barely did. And if you don't, don't worry about it. Just tell people you're doing the rustic version. And you know, there are so many activities involved with cooking that I find very therapeutic. And frosting a cake is way up that list. All right, it just feels really good. And it makes you feel really good. And because of that, while you're doing this, that cake is absorbing all those good feels. Which is why when your guests eat this, they feel good. Or at least that's what I assume happens. But anyway, we'll go ahead and spread over the rest of our whipped cream. And then to finish our cake off, we're gonna cover it with our crumbs. And for that, I'm gonna use the old ricochet method, where we let the crumbs fall against like a bench scraper or a piece of paper like this. And they basically bounce onto the cake and stick onto the whipped cream. And personally, I like to go for full coverage. Although you do see a lot of versions where just the top is crumbed or just the sides are covered and the top is left white. But anyway, presentation's up to you. I mean, you are for all the Vladimir of your crumb veneer. 
and it's up to you to decide how you should be putting these on. But anyway, like I said, I like to cover the whole thing. At which point we can do a little bit of cleanup around the base. And then I have some horrible news. We have to refrigerate this overnight, or longer, to enjoy it in all its glory. And during that time, that whipped cream is going to kind of soak into the layers. And they're going to get even moister and more luscious. So do not try to eat this as soon as you make it. Although if you did, it probably would still be really good. But I did go ahead and pop mine in the fridge overnight. And by the way, I actually did cover it in plastic. I just didn't film that, since this video is so long. And then a day later, I went ahead and pulled it out. At which point I performed the always terrifying maneuver of trying to transfer it onto a cake stand with two wobbly spatulas. But as you can see, that went pretty well. And speaking of things going well, cutting a nice neat first slice out of one of these big cakes is not the easiest thing to do. But much to my surprise, that also worked out better than expected. So I grabbed a fork to go in for a taste. And please note, those toasted crumbs are just not for a garnish. They really do help accentuate that caramelized honey flavor in the cake. And then as far as the cake itself goes, it really is shockingly light in texture, but with a very profound, deep, deep honey flavor. Right, that tiny little amount of bitterness we get from the burnt honey step really is the secret here. And then that slightly tangy whipped cream frosting is just absolutely perfect for this, since not only does it provide a little bit of acidity, and of course a lovely light texture, but unlike most frostings, it is not too sweet. Right, the only thing we used to sweeten that was that little bit of burnt honey. So to summarize, I was very happy with how this came out. And I celebrated by cutting another slice, so I could do a fully food style plate, and then take some pictures. And more importantly, eat some more. But anyway, that's it. My take on Russian honey cake. And no, it's not easy to make. And it does take a lot of time and effort. But it is so, so worth it. And that's coming from someone that doesn't even like cake. So whether you're making this honey cake for your honey's sake, or you're just in the mood for a challenging bake, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below to get the ingredient amounts, the written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.